in order for the guests to get a sense of um, who you guys are and, and what the mission within is, why don't we um, do kind of like a like a who we are intro? Um, and I really like to to start with kind of what you know what led to you kind of finding and fulfilling your purpose or calling, right? Which kind of led to this conversation. And I know it's a different path for both of you. Um, and so, and very interesting paths. So um, we don't have to like go into excruciating detail, but I uh, definitely be good to hear from both of you. So wh why don't we start with you, Dr. Martin? Um, you know, what, where are you from? What's your, you know, kind of what sparked your interest in, psychedelic um, healing and, and then and vet healing and, and you know, leading to the creation of this pretty amazing organization you have. So I got introduced to psychedelics as a teenager and I was really curious about these experiences and how they could help people. Uh, then I had a family member going through addiction and I took her to see an Ibogaine provider and it really helped her get a perspective and a greater understanding of the underlying issues of her addiction. So it really changed the course of my life, too, in seeing that there was something that could treat addiction. I was supposed to become an eye surgeon, but this experience of watching a family member go through this mm -hmm. journey really woke up in me the desire to make these, this medicine more available. So I uh, started working in 2000s with addiction patients, mainly opioid addicts, and did that for about 15 years when I had some Marines come through that were dealing with with heroin withdrawal, and they reported their PTSD was gone, in addition to uh, no longer feeling that they had to use uh, opioids. So that, that really kicked off the, the, the veteran work. Um, and then I met Dr. Kirk mm -hmm. Parsley, who's a phenomenal uh, physician who lives in Austin, and he introduced me to a good friend of his who was suicidal at the time, and they had, yeah. they had found him, you know, uh, you know, ready to, to kill himself. So he brought them down to the clinic, which at the time was called Crossroads. And he had a good experience. And um, that's how the special operations program started was uh, just, mm -hmm. you know, us treating one guy and then that guy referring another and another. And it just, you know, snowballed from there. When when you and I met back in, I think it was around 2012, had you um, started that piece yet? Or, or was it you were, was that in the early days or kind of Help me anchor my timeline. I think we met a little bit later. Um, must have been around the 2015 or 16 mark. So we had already treated a couple of veterans at that point. Uh, unless, yeah, I mean, I, I okay. would have to look through my notes exactly when I met you. But we the, the veteran program hadn't really kicked off at that point. Yeah, I'm, I'm anxious to talk more a little later about, you know, just just what is ibogaine and 5-LEO-DMT and some of the other modalities that you've worked with, you know, so that listeners who aren't clear or maybe have misperceptions, you know, can, can hear from the horse's mouth from you're really a pioneer in this space from medical use of it. Um, but before we do that, Punky, um, you and I met on the battlefield, so to speak. <laughs> it was fun telling those stories last weekend and and for listeners, um, you know, just for, for full disclosure, I, I did go through the program that, that Mike and uh, Martin offered down in Mexico, um, you know, for, for many reasons, actually, which we can talk about later. But I just wanted, you know, so folks know that. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I, 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 you know, I've known you for a long time. And, uh, you know, I've not, I mean, you're, you're a very different person than the individual. And I, I am as well. Then I, you know, the two guys who were throwing down doing scars freaking 30 years ago or whatever. So let's talk about your journey a little bit. And, you know, Navy SEAL Master Chief done all sorts of really cool things. And most people like to double click on that. But, you know, you're all about healing now. So kind of what's your journey about? Yeah, it was really great running back into you again uh, to say. <laughs> Likewise. Yeah. yeah, Mark and I met many years ago on a fighting course. The SEALs uh, used to run called SCARS. So for 30 days, we just got to beat the living crap out of each other. And uh, <laughs> It was super enjoyable. Which says something about SEALs that we actually enjoy that, you know? <laughs> it was really enjoyable. Yeah, I was a 30-year SEAL. You know, came in 86, pre-war. You know, got to run around Europe, um, Europe and South America and have a really great time. I uh, got married, divorced, married again. I uh, had a bunch of traumas during those two marriages. And, you know, then the war kicked off. Um, just in the grind constantly for 
you know, the first 20 or 10 years weren't that bad. Right. Um, and then once the, the war kind of kicked off, just more injuries started to kick in. You know, I had some issues with my divorces, the trauma from that. My uh, my ex had gotten addicted to Oxycontin. She was a triathlete. Came home yeah. dealing with that mess. And then my oldest daughter, the same thing. Um, and then I started suffering blast injuries and was having cog, damp, cog injuries. And that caused its own frustrations of trying to keep up in life. Mm -hmm. uh, then pain set in and then slowly I just stopped really giving a shit. I stopped feeling. I was angry. I was my life at home sucked, so I would find a way to get back on deployment just so I could get out of town and, and into an environment that I could control again um, and did that grind. And then I retired at the end of 16. I look back, I'm like, wow, that was a, uh, that was a grind. And um, thought I was doing pretty good. And then over a series of years, just all these symptoms, I call it my train of life, just slowly caught up with me. Mm -hmm. um, I started drinking heavily. I was just into super, um, just bad behavior, pushing the limits everywhere I was going, just asking for it. Right. <laughs> and, um, two years ago that, uh, we had, right before I got out, I just had a bunch of more friends die. It was my younger guys too. And, and then another buddy of mine and a girl I used to work with died in Syria. So that was a big shocker. And then I had a friend who was having a psychotic break at the same time on top of all these other things, for some reason, over this period of time, my whole world just caught up with me and just melted me down. Um, mm -hmm. I got a DUI, I was, I was running around beating people up. I should have been in jail. Um, and very quickly I became suicidal. Um, wow. you know, I was on all the, the typical meds that all of us get into, you know, from the VA psychotropics, pain meds, sleep aids, that, you know, that caustic cocktail that we get. Right. And I was just spiraling out of control. But I'd heard about, you know, the mission went then and Martin's program from a bunch of other friends that I'd seen kind of go down and they were in the same state I was or worse. And they came back just these completely changed guys. But for some reason, I never dove into it. I never even researched them. I was just like, well, good for you. And that was the extent <laughs> of my of my research and my concern um, until it was my turn. And then it was like I had a buddy that needed help. I was trying to get him in the program. Um, he came over one day and basically found me with a gun to my head. He's like, uh, yeah, let's go get some help. And then it turned into, well, I'll go down with you. And that was our deal. So we went, both went down together, uh, and you know, a four day retreat saved my life, saved his life, uh, got me on this beautiful healing path that I never even knew existed. And since then I've just really devoted, you know, my extra time and whatever time I have just to help it, you know, one myself, my family, then, you know, my brothers and sisters. Uh, it's worthwhile. It's an incredible story uh, for a number of reasons. Um, and I know Dr. Um, Pavlanos or, or Martin has seen this um, many times, but it was kind of hidden from me. So I, I don't think, you know, teammates really admit the extent of the trauma that's been going on and the challenges, you know what I mean? Um, and maybe it's just my, you know, my perspective as you know i i kind of caught that first 10 year phase that overlapped with yours pre-war was my active duty and then my combat experience was you know a dim shade of yours you know i just spent time in iraq on the staff you know so i didn't really and i wasn't a breacher i wasn't a you know uh, an enlisted operator who gets to take the brunt of the the tbi causation you know events particularly breaching and, and bombs going off and whatever so maybe I just missed it, but um, it seems to me that this is a more common challenge. I mean, look at you, like freaking 30 year retired master chief, done all these extraordinary things and, and you're, you're sitting there melting down. And now, uh, you know, what, what caused us to have this conversation was my good friend and platoon, SEAL Team 3 platoon chief, who I recruited out of Buds, Mark Kremp, and phenomenal guy, like just world class hero right you both are and he offed himself and i'm like what the f is going on here you know and how i guess my you know this will kind of lead into a deeper conversation but how big of an issue is this guys i mean how big of an issue is this across is it just a few special operators that across the all services i mean what's going on 
Well, I think the big one is, you know, we come from a very high performance environment, right? So if we're meant to perform, we're always, we know that we're always looked at. Uh, same time, you know, that we ever expose any weakness, you know, the beast is coming, you, you know, you, you expose your belly. So everyone goes through life, I, I, I imagine, just thinking that they can't share, you know, these, these moments where they're, you know, they need help or they're vulnerable. They can't figure it out on their own. Uh, and then I think a lot of it is we just don't feel that we want to burden somebody else with our shit, you know, our stuff. So we're like, hey, I got this by myself, right? And I think you and I right. talked about that in Mexico. It's just like, yeah, mm-hmm. I, I can figure this out on my own. But you can't. How much do you, th- you can't. And how much do you think is the, you know, maybe this is for Martin, but how much do you think is the cumulative effect of TBI that eventually catches up to you and, and literally changes your behavior without you being cognitively aware of it? Yeah, I think, it, I mean, I look back at my life and it, it was very cumulative. You know, I had some childhood traumas that affected my reactions exponentially later on in life. I had, you know, football injuries, you know, tons of concussions. Uh, I was a master preacher in the SEAL teams. I got paid to basically blow myself up or just experiment and play right. around with, with stuff. And you stack that to other injuries. Uh, you stack that with the meds everyone's on trying just to, to show up to work, right, and, right. and move through life, and then you start adding you know, moral injury and tr- other traumas to that. It's a it's a it's a caustic cocktail. It's, right. it, it's bound to happen. Right. You know, it's interesting. And the other piece is um, a lot of this stuff. You know, until the you know, unless or I should say, unless the behavior gets really um, self destructive, that these things can still stack and cause. Um, you know, anxiety, depression, and you can mask that over. And, that, and that's kind of like, you know, to share my story, like I grew up in an, with an abusive uh, father, alcoholism that ran back, you know, from what I understand, like eight generations. And I've shared this openly on the podcast. And, um, and guess how I masked that over, right? <laughs> like it was very convenient in the SEAL teams, right, for us to to operate for weeks in a training evolution and not touch alcohol and then come back and binge and yeah. to think everything's normal because yeah, I didn't touch any alcohol, nor did I crave it. Didn't have any, you know, you couldn't have it because we're, we're operating, we're training, but boy, then I came and, and made up for it in short order. Mm-hmm. Right. And then, um, you know, years go by and, and you find yourself kind of like, Oh yeah, it's normal to have a drink every night. And well, it's not right. <laughs> you know, it's not. And, Literally, that was a pattern. And you can, you know, you can have great success. I mean, I build a lot of cool things, but I was still, I was still my own enemy, right? Holding myself back and also uh, damaging relations in my life, even though I wasn't suicidal. And I wasn't the kind of person who was going to admit that anything was wrong because outwardly everything was damn, looking pretty damn good. Right. You know, and I think that's probably the more common situation. Because seals are, you know, have great self-control and, you know, can really, like, you know, we talked about earlier, tend to solve problems pretty well. And so if you don't have the extreme TBI and kind of the accumulation that you had, then you got a lot of guys going out pretending to be okay when they're really not. Yeah, let me address this next to you and get into the kind of the specifics for those who aren't really familiar with psychedelics and might still have kind of some cultural baggage around psychedelics from the war on drugs and from misperceptions. Uh, can you give us a sense of what these molecules are actually, you know, what they actually do and, and, um, are there risks and if there are risks, how do we mitigate them or, or, you know, you know, generally just maybe educate us a little bit. So the word psychedelic means mind manifesting and these compounds allow a person to gain perspective on different aspects of their personality to see um, their narratives and stories that they have carried on for the the majority of their lives and see them in a different light. Uh, There's also some evidence that they affect the default mode network, which is basically our ego and and, uh, system that kicks in when we're in idle, when we're not focusing on something. So we're, you know, projecting into the future, thinking about the past, worrying about things that might happen, might not happen or regretting things that we've done. And by shutting that down, there's different brain areas that are now speaking to each other, maybe for the first time. And 
this is a very uh, helpful and beneficial state to be in because it increases neuroplasticity, which then also allows a person to incorporate new habits into their lives and having those habits stick. Uh, in terms of the risks, there's psychological risks to all psychedelics. These are very powerful experiences that can be scary and even traumatic. So having the right container, the right practitioner, um, the right dosage, and then having proper integration is critical. Uh, when it comes to Ibogaine, it has particular risks to itself, which is some cardiovascular effects. There's drug interactions with specific medications. Uh, there's a potential for bradycardia, so this is a slowing down of the heart rate. And it's important to be monitored while you're on it so that uh, the medical professionals can detect if, if there's arrhythmias or slowing down of the heart rate. It is rare for something to happen, and uh, most of the risks are in opioid addicts because they are, by definition, not healthy, and they uh, often don't disclose what medications they might be on or what drugs are in their system. And there's also the risk of somebody using drugs after Ibogaine and overdosing because it reduces your tolerance. So Ibogaine is, is a you know whole conversation in terms of, of, of how to mitigate these risks. But for the, the rest of the psychedelics, it's like I said, there's psychological risks and then there's the risks of hmm. not integrating the experience properly. And, and for those, I would point, I would single out ayahuasca and 5-MeO-DMT which are you know, sometimes really hard to, to, to come back from and to properly integrate. So I, I would right. just caution people from you know, blindly going to the first practitioner that they find. Yeah, if I could kind of uh, add to that, um, this kind of inquiry, like I, I've done both ayahuasca and the 5-LEO-DMT, and they're profound experiences. And I would uh, agree that the this experience, the context matters, the uh, intention matters, and also um, your expectations matter, right? And so if you're, if you're going to just do these thinking, it's going to be like a weekend recreational experience with a friend who happens to have come across some or know somebody who knows somebody, it's not a good idea, in my opinion, and I'm sure in yours as well. But a good, a well-curated experience um, where there's uh, pre- preparation and post integration, like you said, and I'd like to talk more about what that looks like. It can be profound because there's some, you know, contextualization and, and support that might be required to help understand some of the experience. And I don't, I've read a little bit about this. Maybe I got this from Michael Pollan in his book, how to change your mind about how context and, you know, just the state of your mind going into an experience can dramatically affect the nature of the experience. Can you speak about that a little bit and kind of what's going on, Martin? Yes, the, the context matters, and it's also important to have trust in the practitioners um, because the therapeutic relationship with these medicines is, is really critical. To talk more about context, so context is, is uh, also set and setting. Right. So it's your mindset when you're going into these experiences and then the setting, which is the physical environment. We focus on providing a clinical experience, but also having a very beautiful uh, surrounding and the right music, the right lighting, and uh, contextualizing these experiences as uh, ceremonial and having the right reverence for them, uh, while at the same time having medical staff and heart monitors and medical equipment present. And I'll let Punky speak a bit more to that because he's been helping us for a couple of years and, you know, setting the right context and helping guys go down to Mexico and helping them feel safe. Yeah, I'd be interested if you could describe um, in that vein just a little bit of the um, adequate preparation and then also what happens in the post experience of the integration. Yeah, so when I uh, screened for the program, you know, so I went through a screening process, went through medical screening, and then met with my coach. So she prepped me, had two beautiful sessions with her, and it was really just walking me through the medicine, like, hey, here's what you can expect, um, but here's also how you should meet the medicine, right? Because um, right. I think I very easily, I think you and I joked about this, I could have come down there going, yeah, I'm just going to crush this medicine. And then <laughs> like, okay, do you want to play ball? Yeah, I think I share with you, not to interject here, but I share with you, that's the, sort of the ad, the Navy SEAL attitude I had when I first met yeah. Martin. And 
up at the SealFit Training Center, and I wasn't prepared for that experience. It was a great experience, don't get me wrong, but right. it, it was incomplete. I yanked myself out of it because I was like, part of me was like, whoa, you weren't ready for this, and uh, it could go south <clears throat> quickly. Yeah, it was that, and then I think coming down, I, I, I laugh when I look back at it, but I see it every weekend when I'm down. You know, you get these operators coming in, and, and you've worked with them and known them for years, and these are some pretty bad guys, and they're terrified. You know, like, yeah, I'm <laughs> freaking terrified too, right? So there's there's a fear. There's a reverence for the medicine, but a lot of the fear is just we're afraid of ourselves, right? Uh, right. What we're going to see, you know, is God going to hand me my ass? Um, all that. So, you know, the staff works really hard in just creating a, a really – safe and loving container and easing all those concerns. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like Martine said, it, it is a clinical, somewhat clinical setting, um, but very nurturing at the same time. Uh, and I think that just right. creates the space that really, you know, lets guys and girls really just kind of let down their guard um, and just you know, right. be vulnerable for probably once in their lives. Right. 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 So in terms of, um, integration coaching is that more like is that where kind of like the therapy part kicks in where someone's like a week later or two weeks later and saying hey mike you know i'm having this experience or you know, this challenge came up or I, i'm remembering this can you just help walk them through it or hold their hand through it yeah <clears throat> excuse me uh the preparation is, is probably the biggest one but the the integration is the most important because Right. I think a lot of us, and I myself included, I felt I, I could just go down. This would be a one shot deal, right? I took my magic right. pill, pill. I felt great, and now my life's going to change for the better. It's not. It's not so though. I still struggled. I still had uh, tons of self doubt would come back up, or I would struggle with memories and thoughts that were coming up. Um, and then slowly, you know, found myself almost stepping back into my same thought patterns and, and habits. And that's where the coaching kicks in. Mm -hmm. Um, and just one, you know, letting guys or girls know that, Hey, this is normal. This is what can't happen. Uh, but you have to do the reps. You have to create, you know, the walk, walk, the walk that you want. Um, mm -hmm. and now you have a really beautiful chance to, you know, to find a, a fresh path, but it does take work. It does take reps. Uh, and that's where the coaches kick in and they've seen it. They've heard it. They've done it. They've lived it. Um, and they're human. And I think, you know, for mm -hmm. a lot of us, even coming back, myself included, I just had a client last week, you know, he was struggling for like three weeks before he finally picked up the phone again. Right. So hey, you got there by yourself before, right? We all get there. So now's not the time to go solo again. Um, right. That's where the coaching is just works hand in hand with the medicine. And then for me, right. you know, working with a therapist, that's where the therapy really can actually do some work because you finally got to the X, you know, you finally peeled the onion back far enough to really get to whatever it is that was kind of started this, this process in life and really start to deep dive the work. Right. Right. Yeah. This is not a panacea, right? I mean, for someone who's hit bottom or is suicidal or, or you know, really struggling with addiction, you know, it, it can have a dramatic impact, but like you said, you know, the work is still to be done after that, the work of integration and then the work of self care. A lot of the uh, times, you know, the people are in those places, the addiction or the depression or whatever it is, has removed any modicum of self-care and they're all in destructive behavior mode, right? And so you got to rebuild those habits, uh, you know, of movement, of exercise, of, of healthy nutrition and sleep and recovery and all those fundamentals. And then that, then it becomes like an upward spiral of, of positive, uh, you know, results. That's interesting. So, um, Martin, I'm curious because, you know, rightfully, especially when dealing with uh, suicidal individuals in Ibogaine, we're, we're really focused on the medical and the therapeutic and then kind of the neuroplastic effects. But there's no question a, um, a spiritual quality to these, you know, to these molecules, right? It's, you know, it's been considered a way to, to experience God or unitive consciousness. Uh, how, you know, how do you think that works? Like what's the physiological mechanism that DMT plays in allowing us to have that experience? What's your perspective on that anyways? So there's a theory that uh, the DMT is acting on a receptor, a specific serotonin receptor that in normal everyday reality helps us to differentiate self from like other. 
like where our body ends and where you know the rest of the world begins so by flooding the these receptors with an exogenous uh, amount or an exogenous mm-hmm. source of 5-MeO DMT we dissolve basically we feel that we become one with everything and it's important to know that DMT and 5-MeO, 5-MeO DMT are neurotransmitters so they're already present mm-hmm. in the human brain so it, it's uh it's almost like we're wired to have these experiences and uh, evolutionarily it could be for you know creating greater cohesion and communion in, in human societies and you know achieving greater things like you know building cathedrals or projects that that require kind of believing in something bigger than ourselves mm-hmm. yeah well said I, I love that and it's interesting you know kind of a historical note that you know these have been used especially psilocybin for I don't know, you know, probably thousands of years, but certainly hundreds of years. And um, I think the first accounts in the U.S. were from the, the conquistadors in Mexico and uh, or South America or, or both maybe. And how they um, they ended up, you know, with the reports back home um, and the, the missionaries, you know, that, that kind of accompanied them. Basically. Out, that was the first example of outlawing these things because the church said, you know what, uh, these people are having a direct experience of God. They don't need the Catholic Church, so we're not going to succeed here. And so they literally, they, they turned them into a heretical, you know, substance banned by the, you know, whatever the religious powers would be of the day, the Catholic Church. So I think that's fascinating because that, that same um, kind of cultural um banning happened in the 60s because of the explosion of psychedelic research with Timothy Leary and through Harvard and Stanford and MIT, you know, the MIT and even the CIA, you know, and that, that was uh, at the harbinger or the forefront, I should say, of the counterculture movement, which was a real threat to the government, which, is, you know, kind of replaced the church as the major control mechanism, right? And so guess what? They get banned again. <laughs> All right. I'm wondering if it's going to happen again. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I guess I'm just kind of riffing here. I have a question. What's your take on all that, Mike, and where we're going with this? Yeah, you know, the way I look at it, the way I like to explain it to myself is, you know, I was born already having this connection with myself and with God or spirit and and earth and life and everybody else. And then life kicked in, right? And slowly that connection that I had got separated. Right. Um. Yeah, I look, I look at this every day. I'm like, all right, when are they going to take this away? You know, we're slowly getting this access back, right? It's really letting men and women heal uh, until the point that, like, hold on, you know, they're cutting out the middleman again. Right. And it's going to get locked yeah. back down. So I'm curious where it's going to go. Yeah, I think the genie's out of the bottle this time, you know. I hope anyways. And But, you know, the what, what could cut it down and this is why I value what you guys are doing so much is, is the indiscriminate use or the improper use, right? Like we talked about earlier. And so I think that's important. Um, I think this is probably something you've noticed, uh, but it was surprising to me that every single individual who was down there with us, Mike, two weekends ago had learned about it from a podcast. That was mind blowing. It's like, wow, like that information is spreading fast. Very fast. And something you said really struck me. You said, you know, you, you, um, you try to avoid sharing your personal experience with the actual, you know, with the actual kind of uh, journey, we'll call it, because everyone's going to have a different experience. Mm-hmm. And I saw that down there. Like every one of us down there had a radically different experience. And so if I had tried to frame an expectation around your experience or something I heard Tim Ferriss talk about or someone else, Joe Rogan, then I could be setting myself up for disappointment because I might go in with an attitude or a mindset, like uh, Martin said, that is inappropriate for what I need. Right. What's your take on that? No, I, I agree. Um, I've seen it too. I think um, I was lucky. My Abigail experience was, it was beautiful. Um, it was exactly what I needed to get the reconciliation that I did. Um but my five wasn't pretty <laughs> at all. Really? <laughs> uh, you know, I got through enough to, to feel love and a, a lot of healing. And I, I felt like I just got tossed out of heaven and couldn't get back in there. And you know, it was, it was me doing it, but I could have very easily walked away from that with the feeling that I failed. Right. I didn't do right. this. You know, all these other guys are upstairs with this beautiful experiences of love and connection and, and I didn't have it. 
Mm -hmm. Um, And I've seen that with other guys and girls too. And and then the more they hear, like you said, with podcasts or the else going down, now they're already coming in on the front end with all these, you know, expectations and and maybe even misconceptions. And Mm -hmm. as best as we try to alleviate that and go, Hey, listen, this is not the path you want to go down. A human, right? So you're going to go into the medicine with some expectation, uh, but right. I think on the back end, being able to take what you got, which is what you need, not what you want, um, and learn how to work with that, because uh, we're right. again, we're we're so self-critical, right? So you could easily come out and just be even more self-critical because you didn't get something, right? Yeah, I'd love to hear from Martin, kind of like the nuances between the different psychedelics so people can get a sense for, Hey, this sounds interesting, Mark, but like, where should I go? You know, do, is it psilocybin? Is it ibogaine? Is it ayahuasca? Is it, you know, 5-LEO, DMT? Is it peyote? What is it? Um, Cause my, you know, and back to expectations before I asked that directly to Martin, you know, I had heard that ibogaine was just a kick in the Jimmy, right? It was super long, painful, you know, like a little bit of a battle. And so I resisted it. And, um, and yet I found it to be the opposite. I actually really enjoyed it. It was a little bit long and I had some nausea, you know, uh, experience, but did not have that kick in the Jimmy experience whatsoever. Actually, my ayahuasca experience was much more painful. Um, so it's so interesting how it affects different people, you know, differently. But Martin, what are the, uh, could you take us like a, just through a little bit of a preview of what these different molecules are like the, in terms of the experience without like try to pre-frame people's expectations and their different uses maybe? There's not enough research yet to definitively say what psychedelics work for what conditions. So there's still uh, a lot of unknowns. Um, what we do now see and, and and the way that we frame it when we're talking to people is that if somebody is actively suicidal then ketamine might be the best option because it's available in the u.s it's uh, fda approved it can be prescribed by doctors and it has a very high success rate for addressing suicidality um, also it's important to note that not everybody should take psychedelics uh, there are a lot of contraindications Specifically, if somebody is manic, it can make them more manic. If somebody is not in touch with reality, if they're you know, hearing voices, this could potentially push them over the edge. So there's other modalities that people should explore first, like flotation or breath work um, or meditation before even embarking on a psychedelic journey. If they have made a decision to take psychedelics, then uh, they have to uh, be mindful about the psychotropic medications that they have in their system. If they're prescribed antipsychotics, if they're prescribed antidepressants, they may need to taper off of them. And that in itself is challenging because you're going to get the opposite of what these drugs are doing. So if you're an, on an antipsychotic for a number of years and you suddenly get off, then you're going to be psychotic. Or if you're an, on an antidepressant, the depression is actually going to get worse when you quit taking it. And while people are tapering, they, they could potentially do ketamine or they can incorporate microdosing. Uh, and microdosing is the ingestion of subperceptual doses of, say, psilocybin or LSD, where you're getting some of the brain healing effects of the psychedelic without the psychological risk. So that is a good place, I would say, for most people to start. Um, and when it comes to, you know, categorizing which psychedelic for what condition, there's some broad buckets. So Ibogaine works best for addiction and I would say for mild traumatic brain injury, but it's also not the place I would start with most individuals. So I often dissuade people from taking Ibogaine. I point them more towards mushrooms or MDMA as a first experience. And then if that does the trick, then they're, they're good. They don't need to do Ibogaine. So, um, that that's kind of a general kind of framework that that we use to look at these uh, compounds with. But you use ibogaine with the vets, and it's been very successful, especially with suicidal tendencies. So so why is that? That's a little bit of a contra- contrary to what you just said. With the SEAL community and with the special operations community, there's a desire by the guys to do what their friends did. So they 
uh, often gravitate to treatments that they've seen work for other individuals. And uh, I do think Ibogaine is fantastic for addressing depression and anxiety and uh, suicidality. And if the person can get down there and they're prepared properly, it's it's a great approach. But we generally recommend uh, at least four weeks of preparation. Um, most people do between two and four, but four is right. is ideal. Um, so so yeah, it's right. it's um, it's hard to to tell people to do something else when when all right. of their brothers have done um, ibogaine, and I think that's that's part of the reason why they've gravitated towards the program. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Um, Mike, you know, I think if there's any vets listening, um, I mean, maybe the cat's out of the bag now, but I'm not sure everyone knows that they can get this, this type of treatment and, and a lot of, if not all other modalities financially supported through different, uh, foundations, like seal future foundation, uh, one example, Naval special warfare foundation. Uh, Marcus Capone's organization, I think it's called Vet, right, or something like that. Uh, how do we, um, like, what's the normal process if someone comes to you and you say, hey, you know, here's, go here, right, or call this person? Yeah, I mean, most of the work that we do wouldn't even be possible without these grants, right? Right. Um, so we get grant funding from different foundations. So, you know, when I went through, I was funded by Marcus and Amber with Vets. Mm -hmm. Um Jesse Gould from Heroic Cards, former Rangers, raising raising capital and, and sponsoring guys and girls, Seal Future Fund, uh, the Hope the Hope Project, uh, mm -hmm. and just and then just individual donors. So, mm -hmm. what I always ask, you know, is that hey, have some skin in the game, you know, some mm -hmm. pay some money into this so we can spread our capital across more people mm -hmm. and and allow for more healing. Um, but yeah. the money, and also you take it more seriously. You take it more seriously. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I think, you know, probably in the last, you know, 10 years or so, I think the communities have just gotten used to so much public support that they almost expect it. Um, and we'd rather, you know, give the support to the guy or girl that really, really needs it. Uh, if I can go out and buy a $10,000 mountain bike, I could probably afford my own healing. Right. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and we've all, we all know those people. So I think they're getting better at it. Uh, but we just go to the website and then we talk to them and then we steer them to the organizations if, if they need funding and we get them dialed in as best we can. And what I've seen most of the time is those people, because we have a backlog, you know, most of these retreats have a backlog. Mm -hmm. And it's funny it, when you're like, well, it's going to take a little bit longer because we have to raise some capital. And then it's like, oh, I came up with the capital. Mm -hmm. I got it. So. Mm -hmm. you know, try hard, but, um, you know, have some skin in the game so we could spread love this, you know, across more people. Right. The mission within, um, you know, you're taking people from despair back to normality. Uh, and I think, I think that's awesome. Do you also work with individuals who are looking more for the spiritual aspect or do you refer that out? No, we've had them come in. Um, you know, I, you know, this is a very intimate weekend, right? You've got, you know, right. five or six men or women down there. Uh, it's best not to have tourists come through with people that are right. really trying to get some healing. Um, do we occasionally get some? Of course we do. Mm -hmm. uh, we've really never seen anything that's really taken away from the weekend. Um, mm -hmm. And it's also be, be careful what you ask for, right? You know, you come in going, hey, I don't have anything to uncover and you may get something uncovered. So my biggest suggestion is make, even if you're coming through as a, um, as a tourist or an explorer that you really take the process seriously, especially the preparation on the front end. Right. Um, but yeah, you know, know that you're going to be in a group down there, um, with a bunch of guys and girls that have a lot of stuff to unpack. Right. The, the saying ignorance is bliss is coming through my mind because, you know, be careful what you look for is kind of what you're saying. If you want ultimate growth, it's a fantastic thing, right? Because yeah. you're going to be shown your your true self. 
Um, but if things are okay and you're just cruising along and you don't want to upset the alpha cart, then be careful what you ask for. <laughs> Stay ignorant, blissful in your ignorance. Oh, that's true, man. It's true. <laughs> Unless you're a wrecking ball. Don't be a wrecking ball. <laughs> That's awesome. I really appreciate you guys. Anything else that uh, that you think would be worth sharing, Martin, that I haven't uh, asked or, or you know we haven't had a chance to talk about? I want to share the our research studies that we have planned and that are starting recruitment, uh, specifically a study for gold star spouses and uh, women that lost men to suicide. We are looking to recruit. 15 women for a psilocybin retreat and 15 women for a 5-MER retreat. They would go to UT Austin, get a brain scan, get biomarkers measured, and then go do a retreat. Uh, and afterwards, go again to get another brain scan to see the changes potentially. And we are, our hypothesis is that psychedelics can help address problematic grief and other mental health issues. Uh, we're also looking to recruit women for a military sexual trauma study. Uh, this one is a little bit further behind, so we are still raising money for it. But we're going to look to see if 5-MeO-DMT can help with post-traumatic stress associated with mm -hmm. um, these ne negative experiences that uh, some women encounter in the military. So if, if you're a widow and if you're interested in participating, uh, please visit missionwithin.org and uh, enroll uh or sign up for to receive more information awesome yeah thank you for that and thank you very much for being here today martin i appreciate it all the way from mexico with our eight second time delay <laughs> how about you mike anything anything you'd like to add before we sign off here yeah i just want to thank you one mark for having us on it's been beautiful seeing you again yeah um yeah and just i think stick to the we're trying to change the narrative right so these are sacred yeah. Healing medicines, we look at it that way. Uh, we're keeping the narrative in that lane. Right. Uh, we want to be able to affect policy change and policy shift. And um, yeah, check out our website and check out Heroic Hearts, check out So Future Fund, check out Vets, check out all the beautiful organizations that are out there doing work and funding these. Yeah, I agree. Oh, yeah. Well, thanks you both uh, for, for joining us today. Thanks for the work you're doing. And um, we'll put all those links in our show notes and on the website. And um, let you know when this uh, episode goes live in case you want to share it on your social media or whatever. Uh, but I think it's extremely important um, work and uh, it's an important um, element or kind of a new avenue for healing. And it's been, it's been just extremely valuable for, for veterans, but I think it's valuable for it, for everybody. So appreciate you guys. And uh, uh, appreciate you brother. Thank yeah. You. Yeah. We'll talk soon. Yeah.